We're going to switch over to the conflict perspective. As a reminder, conflict perspective has three assumptions. There are haves and have-nots in the world. The haves are competing with the have-nots. And this process creates social change. The important questions that we need to ask are, who benefits from these institutions? Whatever institutions we're talking about, whether it's education, whether it's crime, whether it's health care, whether it's illness, we're asking who benefits from the institution and how do the groups that benefit from these institutions maintain their benefits. Keep these questions in mind as we talk about health, illness, and health care. The first place to begin <clears throat> is sort of the overview, organizing principle of this whole perspective which I use is, I call it the industries of illness and healthcare. There are four players in this industry. The first are the producers of illness. I jokingly call this them. Who produces illness? Well, it's them. Who consumes illness? Well, we consume illness, people like you and me. Who produces healthcare? Again, that's them. And who consumes health healthcare? That would be people like you and me. Let's be a little bit more specific here. What we're arguing as sociologists is very different from everything you've ever heard about illness before. Not very different, but somewhat different. Most of us are walking around with the idea that illness is biological. The cause of illness is biological. If we're talking about cancer, well, they're going to ask you about your family history. Did your mom have cancer? Did your dad have cancer? Did your great aunt have cancer? Because our thinking is cancer is genetic and it goes from family to family. A lot of our thinking about illness is either based on genetics or that biology, there's something wrong with the person's biology. Sociologists think about health and illness very differently. The way we look at things is in terms of environment, 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 or context, context, context. It's the world that makes the human sick. Um, again, if you think about the conflict approach, the conflict approach says it's not human nature that's the problem. Humans are fine. It's the culture and organizations that are used to manipulate humans. Same thing here. Our bodies, biologically speaking, for the most part, people are born into this world and they're more or less healthy. And then the world comes in and we start to get sicker and sicker. Some people are not born healthy. Well, again, the conflict approach would say, well, maybe there was an environmental cause that produced illness from that child when they were born. But for the most part, most humans are born rather healthy. And then as they get exposed to environments, they get sicker and sicker. So let's take a closer look at the industries of illness and healthcare. Well, who produces illness? Well, according to sociologists, we're going to look at the alcohol and liquor and beer companies. Beer, you know, it's not it's not a, 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 it's not nutritious for us basically. Well, what about cigarette companies? Cigarette, chewing tobacco, all that stuff. They're producing illness. They're making money off of us using their products whether it's you know drinking beer or smoking cigarettes or chewing tobacco well what about the sugar industry there's a whole industry of people that are making money on sugar water a lot of Americans have diabetes but we again we want to focus on genetics and biology the sociologist says environment 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 let's look at the sugar water that we're pouring down our throats and then 30 40 years later we're coming down with diabetes We've got candy and cookies and cake and all sorts of foods that are just plain unhealthy. Now some of you might be saying, well, people shouldn't drink those things and people shouldn't eat those foods and smoke those cigarettes. I hear you. I understand that. That's, again, sort of the individual perspective. On the macro perspective, you have to ask the question, how much money is going into advertising? Um, if you walk around somewhere, are there Coke machines? Yep. Are there fresh squeezed orange juice machines? Nope. <laughs> um, you know, think about the, the advertising budgets. If you go into a convenience store or a gas station, um, it's predominantly junk food. If you try to go on a road trip, you're eating unhealthy. Um, if you're going on a road trip, you know, you've got McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and all these fast food restaurants. 
Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I know many of you might say, you know, those stupid people shouldn't eat those food or smoke those cigarettes, but let's just acknowledge that there are lots of people making money off of these things, and they're using science to do it. The colors they use to advertise, um, they're, they're all, they're all, their whole advertising budget, they're spending millions of dollars using the most cutting-edge science to get us to want to eat cookies, drink sugar water, smoke cigarettes, smoke, uh, you know, drink beer. There's lots of money and scientific expertise trying to convince us to do these things. Well, we're not just talking about, you know, consuming things that make us sick. What about working at a place that makes you sick? I've got here an image of a chemical factory. Um, this is a producer of illness. If there are chemical factories in, in, in our world or factories that make all sorts of different things, a lot of these fa factories have very, very, very dangerous chemicals and, and gases, and people work in these environments and people get sick. People live by these environments and they get sick. What about pesticides? We like pesticides because it keeps the, the bugs off the food. But what about the people that work at in the farms? They're touching food that's covered with pesticides, then they wash it and take the pesticides off. People who work in the food industry are being exposed to tons of chemicals that produce illness. What about a job like, um, you know, being a manicurist? The chemicals used at a manicure facility are absolutely positively dangerous. Um, dry cleaning, manicures, all these sorts of places from the conflict perspective are producing illness. I really like living in California because California has these signs everywhere that says this area contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. I want to point out that there's three types of things there. There's cancer, there's birth defects, and there's other reproductive harm. Um, these, these signs are all over the place. If you buy a new car, your new car says, you know, cancer. If you're um, buying a product at Home Depot, some of those things say cancer. It's everywhere. Well, not everywhere, I'm exaggerating, but it's, a, it's in a lot of places. Well, how about McDonald's? McDonald's has these signs. Chemicals known to cause cancer or birth defects or other reproductive harm may be present in foods or beverages sold or served here. Sold or served here. Cooked potatoes. Um, basically, McDonald's has one of these cancer signs on their products. Um, lots and lots of products in our society are dangerous and they're surrounding us. So we call this environmental racism and classism. This is from your textbook. The author of your textbook doesn't talk about everything I'm saying, but this is one concept that we both um, see eye to eye on. Illness causing facilities like factories and power plants are located in poor communities. You're not gonna get a chemical factory. You're not gonna get um, a power plant in Beverly Hills. They put them where the poor live. Poor people tend to work in jobs with dangerous chemicals. All sorts of jobs, we don't pay a lot of money for it, and they're dangerous, and poor people work in these jobs. Poor people tend to, tend to be surrounded by unhealthy food. I can offer you a couple of examples of this. Uh, places where I went to college um, were very, very low income. And in one of the places, in uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey, the city pay, subsidized the supermarket to stay in the town because the poor people did not have another place to get their food. And the supermarket was not making money, and the supermarket said, we want to leave town. And people would have basically been forced to not have any produce or vegetables or fruit or any healthy food at all whatsoever if that supermarket would have left. So the town was trying to beg it to stay. Um, in a lot of urban areas where there's a lot of poverty, there are no supermarkets. Uh, one of my students brought me a really great article um, last semester where they compared how much things cost in upper class areas and how much things cost in, in poor areas. To get you know a gallon of milk in a rich area, the price is lower than in a poor area. We think it would be the opposite. Rich people have the means to pay for food, but it's the opposite. Poor people have ho pay higher prices um, for lots of things. Most of the time it's because they're small little stores, little bodegas. 
and they don't bring in a lot of things. So what they sell, they raise have high prices. Big supermarket chains don't want to come to these poor communities, which is sad because they'd also bring them jobs. And then you've got the idea that poor people are under a lot of stress. Put it all together, where people work, the things that surround them, the type of factories and power plants they live by, and you've got something called environmental racism and classism, which is the idea that we locate our, um, our power plants, we, 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 make, we offer jobs to poor people that are very dangerous, and people of color. Um, upper class people, white people, uh, upper class white people generally are not living near unhealthy places, working unhealthy jobs, surrounded by unhealthy food. Put it all together and you've got a pretty good clear of the producers of illness. These are all of the industries making money off of illness. Um, they have poor people working at their facilities, they're selling um, unhealthy things to us, they're telling us to put them in our home. All of it puts together and you've got producers of illness. Consumers of illness are people like you and me. We are the ones who are drinking Coca-Cola and eating the salty foods and smoking cigarettes and um, working you know, 40 hours a week, not getting enough exercise, and then we're consuming illness. The producers of healthcare are all the people making money off of the people who are sick. <laughs> so you've got a lot of people here. You've got doctors, nurses, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, diabetes facilities, all sorts of people making money off of illness. If you can add some more, I'd ask you to do that. And last, we have the people who consume health care, the people who, you know, either we're going to we're going to a, a county hospital or we're going to a private doctor and we're saying we need health care so we're using some of our money or it's coming out of our paycheck or both and we are consuming health care so I like this diagram it helps sort of helps me organize my thinking about health and illness from the conflict perspective now here's the important part about this whole idea of the producers of illness, the consumers of illness, the producers of healthcare, the consumers of health. The problem is being caused upstream, if we think in terms of a river. But health insurance corporations and government want to fix the problem downstream. I have an image to show you which might help um, clear up any confusion. Okay, here we go. Click it again. The cause of the problem in this little silly picture I made is you've got this factory polluting the air and it's all the way upstream. It's polluting the air, just filling the air with, with noxious smoke and you've got a little boy all the way downstream and he develops asthma because he's a poor little white boy and he's you know breathing in these fumes all the time and he's only three years old and he's got asthma. So what does our government, our medical system, our insurance system do? It looks at, at the child as the problem. The kid has asthma. He's a problem. We better fix him. We're going to give him an inhaler. Do you see how the logic here from a sociological perspective doesn't work? The factory, which is making millions of dollars every day, is polluting the air. That factory is the problem. But we turn the child into a problem that needs to be fixed. So what we end up doing is band-aiding and putting band-aids and band-aids and band-aids on things, giving each kid an inhaler rather than going to the source of the problem. Again, the conflict approach says, let's go to the source, let's figure this thing out, and let's fix it. Our threshold has been met, people are, are getting sick, let's fix it. And according to our model that we're looking at here, we turn human beings into the problem. Oh, diabetes? Okay, let's give you some, let's fix, you know, let's do this, let's do that. Rather than saying, let's change the society, let's get rid of the sugar water, say it's illegal, it doesn't do anything for us, let's get rid of the fatty foods or whatever, what have you, let's get rid of this stuff, and that way we fix the problem. It's not even an option. The conflict approach says that's what we should do. Rather than fixing people, let's fix culture and organization. Let's change the way we see food. Let's change, you know, these people who are making millions of dollars off of unhealthy food. Let's look at them, not the guy who's eating 
the McDonald's and the guy who's smoking the cigarettes, that guy, to them, is a victim. 